Yes. Hey, John, how are you, man? Good, good to good see time. you. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you, man. All right. Full house. We do have a full house. So uh, welcome, everyone, to the uh, winter wonderland that is Durham. We got our first snow last night, which is kind of cool. Change of pace. I am uh, very pleased to welcome Boardroom University to Duke uh, and our virtual class, MMS 275, Business of Sports and Media. I want to give a special uh, introduction to a few special invitees. Uh, Dean John Blackshear is Dean of Students. He's the Associate Vice President of Student Affairs. You know, we all know Duke is uh, an extremely special place. We have the very best students in the world. Uh, the best faculty, <clears throat> and we also have the best administrators, and that's often overlooked. John really does check two of those boxes. He's a wonderful scholar and administrator. Uh, as Dean of Students, he's responsible for the student experience, and I think we can all agree that uh, the Duke student experience is second to none, so thank you, John. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you for having me. Um, also, Lou Mayone, my co-instructor, uh, he's the CEO and chairman of Sports Grid Media Properties. You know, Lou spends his days working on uh, multi-million dollar content partnership deals with Fox and NBC and FanDuel, DraftKing. And every Thursday night, he joins our class to teach our students about media business. Uh, in the middle of his hectic schedule, he finds time to teach our students. And I think that says all you need to know about my friend Lou. Uh, two other people, uh, Amy Unell, uh, she leads Demon, which is Duke's entertainment and media. Uh, she knows just how much interest our students have in the panel discussion that we're going to have tonight. She's done a great job cultivating that program. And uh, my head of my department, Martha Reeves, who just does a wonderful job with MMS, makes it the strong department that it is and always gives us the support we need. So thank you, Martha. Now, on to our remarkable panel. And uh, not many of you might know this, but I have a lot in common with these industry leaders. Rich Kleiman, now Rich and I both repped top five NBA picks. Okay, he repped Kevin Durant, I repped Christian Leitner. Yes, he co-founded Rock Nation Sports and now partners with KD and the multi-purpose tech media company, 35 Ventures. I managed Christian for four years, quit and moved to Paris. Um, so, uh, and yes, Rich, KD does have two Olympic gold medals, two NBA championships, an MVP, and he's a 10-time All-Star, and he's earned a quarter of a billion dollars. But in fairness, I did get Christian into People Magazine's 50 Most Beautiful People, and I did get a personal tour of the Playboy Mansion for us from Hugh Hefner. So I think that kind of averages out there. Now we come to Eddie Q. Uh, and I think Eddie and I were also separated at birth. He graduated from Duke with an econ and a computer science degree. I graduated from Duke with an econ and Russian degree. Great career choice there. He's a 32 uh, year career veteran of Apple where he was responsible for iTunes, the App Store, now Apple TV. And uh, I own an iPhone. Model number is not important, but again, you're feeling it. And by the way, we both watched Golden State win the 2018 NBA championship. I mean, he was courtside with Beyonce, Jay-Z, and Rihanna, and I was watching it at Divine's. But again, I think you see there's a lot of synergy in this room. Uh, finally, we have uh, Justin Toman, who's head of sports marketing for Pepsi and a former Olympic uh, gymnast qualifier, and I like to drink Diet Pepsi and watch the Olympics. Again, it's eerie how close I am to these panelists. So with that, Justin, I'm going to turn it over to you, and I want to thank Pepsi for sponsoring uh, this boardroom event at Duke, and take it away. <laughs> and thank you very much. Appreciate the intro. Um, and, and I, too, own an iPhone, so I'm right there with you. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, everybody. Um, Pepsi really is excited to partner with the boardroom and, and really excited to listen to today's discussion. Um, in preparation for this, I did my research on Duke, in fairness, and, and, and candor. I'm a Michigan fan. 
I looked up what what is the all time Michigan Duke uh, record in basketball, thinking it was probably a pretty cavalry. Um, unfortunately, it is not. Out of the 30 times the two teams have played, Duke has won 22 of them. So uh, Edge goes to Duke by, by just a hair there. Um, so again, thank you guys for having me. I, I will be very brief and then you'll get into uh, what you really came here for, but just a little bit about me. Um, I've been at Pepsi for 13 years and I do lead our sports marketing across all of our beverage and snack brands, as was said. Um, and really Pepsi is one of the biggest sponsors in the sports industry. We have over a hundred team league athlete and sports media partnerships that, uh, that we're responsible for, for overseeing and managing. Um, and Pepsi is so fortunate to work with some of the best properties and personalities in the industry. And the reason we make, we, we as Pepsi and our brands make such a big bet on sports is because we believe that sports provide really an unmatched opportunity for our brands to connect with millions and millions of passionate fans. And we think if we do it right, if we find the right partners and activate those partners in the right way, it becomes a massive driver for our brands or our business. And hopefully one example that you guys will all be watching uh, a week from this coming Sunday will be the Pepsi Super Bowl halftime show, which we're really excited about the weekend headlining the show. Um, so, so really great example of the truly biggest moment in pop culture and our brand is proud to be at the very heart of it. Um, so really quickly in closing, I know many of you are looking to get into the sports industry I will give my, my three bits of wisdom here if I've learned anything, um, which are number one, um, love and learn the business of sports, right? It, it is not enough to be just a fan because I'll tell you, as they say, sweets and seats get old pretty quickly when you're working nights and weekends. So you really need to love that business and learn, learn it inside and out. Know the economics of it, understand the trends and find unique ways that you can provide value and instigate change. Number two, learn all you can about the non-sports stuff. It seems counterintuitive, but learn economics, real estate, learn finance, media, take law courses, courses on negotiation, all that stuff will really be critical to your success in this multifaceted world that we all live in. Um, and finally, be open to a non-linear career path to get where you want. It's the idea of setting a compass in the right general direction, but being open to some twists and turns on the way to get there. So that is it from me. Again, thank you guys. Pepsi is proud to partner with the boardroom and Rich and team and really looking forward today to the discussion with Eddie. So Ed, back to you. Thank you guys. Thank you, Justin. Sorry for the delay there. Um, yeah, without further ado, I am going to turn it over to a, a true uh, e industry uh, leader in so many different industries, uh, which is Rich. And I would be remiss if I did not mention to our illustrious Duke crowd and panel that in the audience is probably the most decorated Duke quarterback since, oh, I don't know, Brett Bennett which is going back quite a bit, but uh, Daniel Jones, um, star of the New York uh, Giants and a future all-star, I am sure of that. Uh, but Rich, I'm gonna turn it over to you uh, and you and Eddie can have your Q&A. Thank you, Ed. And just for the record, I also watched the 2018 championship in the same arena as uh, you and Eddie. Um, but thank you guys, thank you students and everybody watching. Welcome to Boardroom University. This is a new program from our sports business platform, Boardroom. We launched Boardroom as a way to give fans a real inside access to what's going on in the sports business. Through interviews, features, podcasts, our newsletter, our trading card vertical and more. With Boardroom University though, we wanna bring those insights from athletes, executives, to you guys, college students, in a relatable real life way that as a kid, I would have died to have access to. So I am truly excited to continue tonight at Duke University with our very special guest and my friend, Mr. Uh, Eddie Q, please. Hey there, Rich, it's great to see you. It's great to see you. You know, I, I don't think I'd ever, I, I don't think I would ever have said this, but one of the things I miss the most about KD leaving the Warriors is I don't get to see you in person as often. Man, I appreciate that. I, I, it, that to me is the same thing. Like I almost stayed back when Kevin came back to New York, but I had an amazing time there. Um, so, you know, Eddie, at the end, we're gonna bring like four or five students up to ask you questions. I'll promote them to the screen. Um, but let's start 
where we are now at Duke University. Um, go back to when you were at Duke and tell me a little bit about what life was like for Eddie Q at Duke and what your experiences were like. Well, Duke was a little different back then. Uh, not a lot of people knew about it as, as it wasn't as popular. Uh, our basketball team, my freshman year, uh, lost to a division two school at home and uh, lost in the last game of the season was the first round of the ACC tournament. They lost to Virginia by 42 points. <laughs> and so, uh, and so the, uh, the alums and everybody else wanted to have coach K fired, uh, around it. Um, uh, but it didn't happen. And so, uh, so it's a little different from that viewpoint as to where we are today with Duke and sports. Uh, but one of the, the things that was great about Duke, I came from Florida at the time. Um, we got to, you got to meet a lot of people. It's a, it's a university that was very broad, but yet was small. And what I tell people that made Duke really special is everyone came from all around the world to a place where you were in enemy territory because basically everyone around us was either a Carolina fan or an NC state fan. And there's something about that when it's you against the world, you know, that more than you, you see that in sports all the time, it really brings people together. And in a way Duke was a team against the world. And so I can tell you that I've never seen this in any other university. When I meet somebody from Duke, there's just an instant connection there. And, you know, a lot of people call it the Duke mafia and other things that they, they label it, but it was because of that. You, you, you really got this close knit organization. And so it was really special for me. That's amazing. I definitely get jealous at times. Like I didn't, I didn't finish school. We don't have to talk about that. And I don't have a real college basketball except for St. John's where I know Mr. Mike Craig is listening in the AD there at St. John's. So I get jealous at times about what Duke has and the Cameron crazies, but St. John's, maybe we'll get our version of it soon. But I, of all the people I've met, successful people that couldn't figure it out and didn't do well in school, entrepreneurs that took their own path or dropped out, or incredibly successful people that said that they wish they had focused on other things, but were so like laser focused on school and success. When you were at school, like you obviously did well, I'm sure you did well, you went on to a successful career, but did you have a healthy balance? Like, did you party and get it and live the life of a student? Well, I think that's one of the great attributes of Duke actually, which is obviously it's a great educational institution, but I think it's also like, a normal place. <laughs> it, it wasn't just all work. It was, there was work and, and fun. And so it really had the, the, the two things together. I, and again, it's another a, a really great attribute of Duke that you get. And, and you learn that it's important. And, you know, some of the things you learn in life and some of the things that I learned in business don't always happen at work. Sometimes they happen elsewhere, yeah. um, you know? And so you and I became close not at work. We got, you know, we became close, you know, at my house one night. Yeah. Not uh, just one night. Not just one night. Eddie well, it was, a long, I, it, was, it, was a, it was a long night. Uh, a long night. A long night. Yeah. Eddie Q and I, a uh, little known fact, Eddie Q, myself, and a few others, Kevin was with us, I won't name the rest of the group, got together to watch the 2016 election together. So, well, needless to say, uh, it was a night we'll never forget. But, um, but yeah, yeah no, but, I agree with you but, because. Oh, go yeah, on. I was gonna say, but your point is is dead on. Look, you, you have to, you know, you, you, if you work hard, you have to also be able to let loose, and and it, it's a re-energizing factor too uh, in it. But what I found at Duke um, is you gotta love what you're doing. Ultimately, that's the most important part because you don't want it to feel like work. And so most of the time at Duke and most of the time at work, it, it's it's what you love to do. And so that's that's the key. No, I agree. You know, I think another thing that I, any student that I speak to now, I can't, I'm not the right guy to really harp on the scholastic part of a school experience. It wasn't my resume. However, the network that I met along the way, whether it was in high school, in my years at college and beyond, how important it was to stay in touch with your network and to build relationships that when you get older in life, you start to see they become not just family friends, but potential business partners and people that you build with. Did you see some of those people from your Duke experience turn into those people later in life? You do, and you know, one of the first things that's, it's, it's, you can say it's humbling, but I loved it. You know, you meet people that are way smarter than you. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that I've learned, I'm only as good as the people that I get to work with. 
Yeah. And so you really want to find some people that have, you know, and, and it's even better if they've got attributes or skills that maybe aren't your best. Yeah. And so when you put the two of them together or three of them together, and so that's one of the things that you learn at Duke really well, which is I met some incredibly brilliant people in certain areas that I wasn't really good at. Yeah. And probably was never going to be that great at. Uh, but then you realize if you, you, you get together with them, now you can do things together that you could never do on your own. Yeah. And, uh, and so that connection has stayed. And as I mentioned, if you go to Duke, when you leave, you'll have it. I guarantee you all, all of you will have instant connections with anybody else from Duke uh, because you have that in common. Yeah. I, 100%. Again, why I'm jealous of, of that at times in my there's life. Still, by the way, there's still time for you. That's true. I don't mind. If you get me an honorary degree at Duke, man, I'll put the shirt on. I promise you. And the St. John shirt, Mike Craig. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> so when you got closer to graduation, which I'm sure a lot of people that are listening think about, like for me, from the time I was born, I wanted to be regarded in my work. I thought about that. I knew I couldn't play NBA basketball when I was 15. I realized it. But what I knew came with that, I liked some of it. I liked the regard of being successful at what you do. Did you have aspirations like that? Or were you just trying to get a job out of Duke? Like what was your mind? What were you thinking about doing closer to graduation? Yeah, it's, look, the, the funny thing for me is I, when I was a senior in high school, I discovered computers. Um, <laughs> I'm a little older, so computers weren't very popular back then. It was an Apple II. And I wanted my dad to buy it for me. I was trying to convince him to buy it. It was $2,500 back in 1980. So if you kind of think of that, that's about buying a $10,000 computer today. And my dad was like, I'm not buying you a $2,500 video game machine, which is what he thought it was. But I saved some money and finally got it. And I fell in love with it um, because it let me create things that didn't exist, right? So when you start, you got this, it's almost a blank sheet of paper and you write code and you can do things that you just, you know, you couldn't imagine. So I would stay up all, all night long. My parents would wake up. It was time to go to school. And they, I would get like in trouble because I didn't go to sleep. And I had to go to school. So I kind of was lucky that I discovered something that I loved early on. So when I went to Duke and I was graduating, I knew I wanted to be a, a programmer. And my dream job was to work at Apple. But kind of like today, when I graduated from Duke, it was one of those downturns. And so the economy wasn't doing well. You know, the certainly the, the PC industry had kind of gone up and was now going down. And so at the time, I was like, I was looking for a job. I was it was a tough time. And it reminds me today, it's not the perfect time to graduate uh, today, but I was looking for a place to start. Um, and I figured no matter what it was, I was willing to try anything. And we'll get to that later on, because I think it's an, uh, one of my best attributes that's let me learn and, and be as successful as I am is trying. And so I took a, the first job that I took out of, out of Duke was at RTP in Research Triangle Park. And it wasn't because I had a lot of job offers and that was the one. No, there weren't that many job offers. I took the one uh, that was the, the best one. And it was programming a telephone switch that I never got to use. Um, and, uh, but it was the beginning. And luckily, nine months later, uh, I landed at Apple, um, which was my dream job. So, um, but it was, it's, it's about trying new things. And so I was, you know, when you graduate, you, you don't know a whole lot, honestly, about what the job markets are like or what it's like to be in a, in, in, in a job. And so uh, I think it's important to just not not narrow yourself into thinking, oh, I've got to find the perfect job uh, when you first start. Um, you you got you to try things out and see if, if you get lucky, maybe the first job is perfect. But uh, most of the times it's not. But you'll learn some things from it. What was Apple like when you got there? What was the... No, it was... It's it's funny. It was uh, it was it was the end of the desktop publishing heyday. So it was the first time there was a laser printer. You guys, it's kind of funny, but a laser printer back then was ten thousand um, dollars, and uh, it was big into desktop publishing. And so when I first got there, my first day on the job, it turns it's the last week of the quarter, and my boss who just hired me says, "Hey, we're under budget." Um, find anything you want to buy and go buy it. If you're, you know, I was 22 years old or whatever, I'm thinking like, I found my dream job. Yeah. <laughs> but you didn't, what I didn't realize at the time is like, oh my God, this is how mismanaged this place is. 
that I've been there a day and they're saying, go spend money on anything you want. Not that it was required for work or that I was going to do anything. It was just, it was a, it was a really mismanaged company at the top. Um, and so sure enough, you know, less than a year later, it started going down, 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 down. And I guarantee you, none, nobody listening to this uh, that's at Duke today is going to believe me, but Apple was bankrupt uh, 25 years ago. We, we lost $2 billion and we had to borrow money uh, just to make payroll. And so, uh, so it, wasn't, it wasn't a great place um, as a success, but I learned a lot through that. So I, it's, you were probably there at an interesting time, right? Because it, now that the company was in like dire straits, if the company was going to rebound, you were a part of rebuilding this brand, so to speak. Um, and where you are now and where you started, there's probably so many different roles and jobs and responsibilities. And I know that like a lot of time in this culture today of people wanting so quickly to like get successful and hearing so much of it on social media and being scared about getting into a corporate environment where you can't see the light. And you obviously navigated through Apple to the top, top, top of Apple. As the company was growing and as you were growing in different roles, like how was it for you to navigate? Because I always wonder how, like there's almost people you have to come over in order to get to the top, but you also want to be political in some ways and you're part of a corporation. So like, how was that rise within Apple for you? Well, one thing I, you can say I'm lucky at is obviously the company grew a lot. And when you're in a company that's growing, you get a lot of opportunities because with growth, there's new things that you get to try. And in a way, to your point, someone doesn't have to die for you to get that job uh, because yeah. there are new jobs getting created all the time. So I was, I was lucky in that respect. But, you know, what I found is, you know, there were times where the opportunities came fast and the promotions came fast and other times when they came slower. I never worried a whole lot about that. What I was always worried about and what I cared about was, was I doing something that I wanted to do? Was I learning something that I enjoy it? Did I think I could make a difference in what I was doing? And I figured if I did that well, then ultimately it'll pay off. Yeah. I didn't know whether it would or not. And over the years, it always did. And so um, that's what I looked for. And so I was willing to, you know, I did a lot of different things. I ran a call center, for example. I ran a call center, a 24 by seven call center. When you run a call center, like you realize hiring people for the great shift is a tough job. Most people don't wanna work in the great shift. Yeah. Um, the other thing you learn is like, when you deal with a customer over the phone, and, and this is something I would have never gotten had I not done that role for a period of time. You learn the empathy of when you're designing a product how every detail matters. Because when a customer's calling you and has a problem or doesn't understand something, they're not in the, don't worry about it, we'll fix it later, or you'll, we'll, we'll fix it in the next release or any of that standpoint. You really, you, you gain empathy for that. And, and so when I'm building products after that, I really cared about everything because I was like, no, 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 we can't do that. It's not okay that you have to read the manual to do that, or it's not okay that some support document, or I got to call somebody for help. No, we got to fix this now. Otherwise, we're not shipping. So you guys really listen to customer feedback. We do. You, you can listen, by the way, you can listen to customer feedback to make what you have better. Customers can't tell you how to innovate. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the danger here. Um, and as you get bigger, it, it's harder because as you get bigger, your customer's giving you lots of feedback of how to make your product better. Um, and so it's easy to think it's like, well, I don't have to do the, the innovative thing because I'm, they're telling me what to do, right? I, I'm getting a lot of feedback on it. But the, the hard thing, and, and you know, at the end of the day, what we're all really, what you're looking for and what we're all paid for and what you should want is to be able to think around the corner. Um, how, do you, how do you figure out the things that people want before they know they want them? Um, so, and, but I think all that being said, I do think some corporations don't have a culture that allows growth at times. And Apple has a renowned culture. Um, why do you think the culture there has this reputation, obviously well-deserved, and how would you describe what that culture is today? Well, I think it's because the company got started by a couple of guys in their 20s. 
And so it starts with, you know, they didn't have any experience. They didn't have, you know, they didn't grow up having, you know, 20 years or this. And so the culture of the company from day one was, it didn't matter what your age was. It didn't matter what you did. What mattered was what you were doing. And, and to this day, that's still the case at Apple. And so um, your, your company uh, is the kind of, it has the DNAs of its founders and it's really hard to change that. Uh, we went through a time where we were changing it in a negative way and luckily we got them back. But, um, and so what this company was always about is the products themselves that we were building. And, you know, it's easy. Everybody says, oh yeah, the customer is the most important thing. The product's the most important thing. But it's, it's not true for a lot of people if you look at their actions. So yeah. it, it all depends on what you do. Yeah. And so for us, we really, you know, obviously look, we just had an incredible quarter. Biggest quarter probably in the history of, of, uh, of business this last quarter. We made a, had 100 and, over $110 billion of revenue in one quarter. Never been done, in, I think, in the history of business. But it's never been about that. That's kind of the end result, yeah. um, but it's, it's, it's about creating great products that people want. And if you do that really well, then the numbers always come along. And that's the way we've always looked at these things. And, and, and it's, it's so uh, refreshing in a way because that's what keeps me excited. I get to work on things that we think are gonna make a difference that are material to the customer. And then we go do those things. And sometimes they may not be the best things for even Apple, but in the short term, but they always are in the long term or medium term. But so obviously the founders laid the groundwork, but I, I know from spending time with you and also spending time with you with Tim Cook, there is a certain quality about the two of you that is different than so many other CEOs and leaders of companies and none of them the size of Apple, uh, that you guys just have this relatable kind of real life and very approachable demeanor about you. And, you know, it very much is in line with, to me, what Apple's products have been. And, you know, I could imagine that I, it was, if you ask people, there's a column in a New York paper, like New York Post, I hate to even admit I'm reading it at this point, but they have a article on Sundays where they always ask these athletes, for like five dinner guests, everybody lists Steve Jobs. And to think that, he's changed the world, like literally changed the world and has list, helped so many people in so many different ways. Like, and you've said has been a mentor of yours. What, like, is there a gift that you took from him that you like could point to one gift that you believe, not in terms of Apple, but just in life that you took from him? Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's the attention to detail, everything matters. Every little detail matters. I used to joke around that if I, if I wrote a, a book about my career, the title would be off by one pixel. Um, and, and a pixel on a screen, right? There are tens of hundreds of thousands of pixels, right? Um, and that was the attention to detail that we have. It's like every little detail matters. Uh, you may not think it matters, but even when you, when you take an iPhone, you never get to see the inside of the iPhone. Yeah. Um, it's never visible to you, but if you were to open it, you'd be amazed at, at the attention to detail that we have inside of it. Uh, you, you experience it with the packaging, for example. You know, we were the, really the first company that took packaging and took it to a whole other level where the, the experience that you have when you buy one of our products and you open it, it's like, it's amazingly fun. You feel great about it. It's a representation of the product. It matters. And right. and that was the gift that, that, that he gave me that... Um, uh, you know, I hope I'm like even a tenth of what he was, but it's, uh, you know, I really care about everything. It, it all matters. It does. You know what I like that you guys do? You stop putting a lot of stuff in the box because you realize no one wanted the stuff and it was like, you didn't need two of them. And then all of a sudden it's like, you get the new phone and it's like, they, they thought of it already. And I really do, uh, really do commend you guys for that. That's one thing I've noticed. There you go. Um, so, the funny, the, the thing that I find amazing about Apple right now, um, very few, if any companies could ever do anything like this, is you guys make the most incredible product in the world. And you're renowned for that. And now so quickly you've been thought of and renowned as being this entertainment conglomerate. And the taste and sophistication and the content you put out 
so incredible. I mean, Apple TV, Apple Music, iTunes, iTunes, and you played a major role in all of it. But before you were there, before you guys got into, let's say, the content space, right? For lack of a better word, what was Apple your original ambition? Because you were the you you have built what is the biggest hardware company in the world. So what was the ambition around content? We didn't have an we didn't have an ambition around content. Ironically, right? Our ambition was it, it started with we were late to the game with CD players in our computers and music going digitally. And part of what, you know, I'll tell you something that's very unique about Apple. And I think very few companies, any, anybody can have this, which is every product that we work on, I get to use every day, pretty much. I live on it. I live on it for my personal life. I live on it for my work life. My wife does the same thing my kids do, my relatives do, my friends do. So by the way, if we ever do anything wrong, shame on us. <laughs> Because we've got all this, all of us are using living it every day. I always joke around when you go look at, you know, if you go to a car company, for example, and you go to the parking lot outside, like very few people work on the, drive the car that they work on even. Uh, and, and so, you know, if, you, if you're uh, at McDonald's, you don't eat at McDonald's every day, right? So it's just like, we are living it day in and day out. And it, it allows us to do these things that, that make it and it opens up these opportunities. So when you look at the, at the media space, what happened was, you know, and this happens in a lot of industries as technology comes in, um, in, in the case of media, it's really helped them tremendously. So like the music industry didn't come up with CDs. Uh, the movie industry didn't come up with a VHS tape or a DVD. Technology came along and they rode the ride with it and it made them tremendous amounts of money. But they were used to doing things a certain way and their industry doesn't change very often. So these are industries that last a long, long time and, and they don't really fluctuate a lot. And so when technology came along and started moving faster than them, they couldn't keep up. And so it gave us opportunities where we were sitting here going like, well, wait a second, why do I have to go buy a CD at a store or through Amazon in order to get a song when I wanna to listen to it right now? And, and so that's what created the thing of like, okay, well, we really didn't want to get in the content space, but we realized the people in the content space aren't going to do the things that customers really want. And so we've got to go do it. And we thought we had a, an angle to it um, that was going to be the way it was going to be done. And we'll talk about this in sports because I think we're at that moment right now in sports. Um, and so we'll talk more about that later. But so in, in media, that's what's happened, right? These industries, change is coming, it's huge. And the incumbents, a lot of times, aren't the winners. Yeah. And it's because they can't move fast enough. If you're in the technology world, I mean, none of you want, you know, you were laughing by somebody said, oh, iPhone, I won't say which number it is. Well, there's no one here who wants the iPhone 7, 8, 9, 10, or 11. You know, you want the latest one. And the old ones, they get like tossed after a couple of years, right? That, you know, you, nobody wants the original iPod, nobody wants something. And so we're used to change. Our business is, you know, changing all the time. What do you, you know, you got to do the next great thing. You only care about the next great thing. Nobody cares about what you did yesterday. In media, they're not so used to that. These things last a long time. These, you know, movie lasts for a long time. And, and so, and, and, you know, you look at things like the NBA. The NBA has existed for a long time the way that it is, right? And COVID's forced them to do all these changes for the first time. That's very different. Some of them I think are really good. Like, you know, having the eight, nine play in game, yeah. you know, I thought was really great. That would have never happened without COVID. Right. So change sometimes forces you to get a lot better. And in technology, we've got that. And that's what we're trying to bring the media, which is, you know, to make it change faster to, for the better. So, so then let's stay on sports for one second, because obviously there's always talk about where technologies companies can go when media deals are up with leagues and we don't have to go into that as much as what can Apple do or what do you think is a future for Apple having more involvement in sports in general, whether it was content, partnership, viewing, anything? Well, let's start because everybody in, in the call is, is interested in sports and careers. And, you know, I started by saying that the lucky part that I had at Apple was there was a lot of change and with it growth. And that gives you opportunity. 
I actually think we're at exactly that same inflection point in sports because the, the, the reality is sports today is, is primarily driven um, through television and it's broadcast channels and ESPN. And if I were to ask anybody on this call to raise their hand, I can't see him, but it doesn't matter because you'll, you'll get the point. If I asked how many of you think that the primary way in which all of us are gonna be consuming sports is a broadcast channel or a, a subscription cable or satellite service of ESPN 10 years from now, there's not a single person that would raise their hand. Not a single person. And so, okay, maybe it's, is it five years? Is it two years? Is it seven years? Who cares? The point is there's a lot of change coming and it's not clear. There's none, you know, I can't I give you an opinion on what I think or whatever, but nobody really knows. Yeah. But that change gives us all opportunity and they're gonna be winners and they're gonna be losers. Yep. around this and it's going to be better by the way because the winners will make sports better than it is today and there's things like gambling and there's you know all kinds of different things that will make it a much much better experience yep. um and that's what what's cool about sports right now so you can get really negative about sports right now you know most people go and say oh, look at the ratings the ratings are way down that's true ratings are way down but they're way down because the way that sports is getting distributed today is not the way that people want to consume it yeah. Right. And OK, that's OK. But don't tell me that sports aren't important or are going to are you not going to go away. I mean, they're going to become even more important because there's nothing like competition live. You don't know what you know, what the outcome of it is. Um, those are things that, you know, are they're not going to change. So I, I, I think we're in a, in a perfect time to be going into sports as a career because of all this change. I, I couldn't agree with you more and not to make a shameless plug, but it really was in a lot of ways, the kind of uh, the genesis behind Borden because it was Kevin and I talking a lot about just the, the uniqueness of our partnership, our relationship, the kind of non-traditional path that I took into a job that like I'm blessed every day to have. I can go into these arenas and watch basketball and build a company all around the fact that I work with one of the greatest basketball players in the world. and. I didn't think that traditional publications that had covered sports or sports business were really talking to fans and kids and showing them that relationships like this is what the sports industry works looks like now. And I really do think that there are so many different verticals, so many different entry points into the sports business. Like you said, ratings may be down. The Q rating of sports globally is off the charts. It's mainstream, it's pop culture. And I do think it's an incredible time. The relationship between technology and sports is only going to continue to grow as well, right? Do you see this like a tremendous future for how we can view sports and the technology that we can use? Well, the, one of the reasons, too, why you feel that way is that the power dynamics are changing, right? So if you think about it, the, the power dynamics is, is kind of the leagues and ownership and the distributor, meaning the, let's call it the broadcast channel. And, and they really controlled sports. But look at what athletes are doing today. You know, you're sitting here with me because of that. Yeah. Um, and so the dynamics are changing where the power is getting more distributed and technology is what allows that to happen, right? You know, you can have, you and I are having this audience today. We couldn't have done this, you know, not even 15 years ago, right? You, you couldn't do this. So, you know, KD can't reach his audience, can't communicate with them, can't, you know, and so there's all these dynamics that are changing that technology makes possible that I think ultimately makes it better for everyone yep. um, around it. And, and technology, absolutely. Look, you know, um, it's great. I, you know, there's some, I, I think obviously fantasy is a big deal. Uh, but today it's, it's, it's kind of weird. You know, I have a fantasy team. I want to see all the highlights. I can't really do that for my fantasy team. That'd be an easy technology problem to fix. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I love, we're trying to do this on, on TV plus I'm a huge sports fan. I love the NBA. Um, you know, some, a lot of people don't care if Sacramento's playing the Phoenix Suns tonight. If the game is close in the fourth quarter, I want to watch yeah. because they're incredible athletes and players on there. And, but today it's kind of hard. I mean, I got to be looking on my screen or whatever, you know, it should be easy. Notify I should be able to click. It should go picture in picture. I mean, there's so many dynamics of this stuff that is not rocket science, but because of the distribution vehicle, meaning, hey, I've got to go through some crappy old 
cable or satellite box um, that's a one-way street. I can't do a lot of things. Yep. And that's part of what's changing, right? So kids today are getting their sports from Twitter and, you know, and Instagram and getting highlights and all of that. But it's because they haven't been able to get it in the traditional way because it's been stuck. Yep. But that's all opportunity. That's yep. the beauty of this. A hundred percent. How many employees are there at Apple? A lot now. We have about, uh, probably about a hundred and just somewhere north of 100,000 is about 120,000. Um, we have about 70,000 in retail uh, with all of our um, stores. And then we have certainly millions if you kind of look as part of the way that the world works today is it, it, it takes you, you work with a lot of companies, right? So our manufacturing and uh, different areas, when you kind of look at the Apple ecosystem and developers, there's tens of millions of people uh, behind it. Um, so I know you don't lead all of these people, but you probably lead a tremendous amount of people. And you talked about, uh, some of the gifts Steve gave you, obviously coach K is a friend of yours and a renowned leader. Um, and I know you guys have programming that you worked on together and his leadership, like I said, is something that companies look to, et cetera. What is your, what would you say your leadership style, style is? And, and I guess, has Coach K influenced it at all? And just overall, what would you say like Eddie Q's leadership style is? Yeah, look, I, I think Coach and, and, and very much Steve did, here's something, <laughs> you, you kind of say this and it's gonna sound crazy and kind of dumb, but it's so true. Their, their work ethic is off the charts, just off the charts. They love what they're doing, we'll get to the loving. And, and you know, Coach K, he coaches a game in November like it's the final four. This guy's done it for 40 years, 50 years winning, you know, everything there is to win. And yet he cares about that game yeah. in October, which is at the end of the day is, is, you know, if you're sitting on the outside, we'll argue it's meaningless. It's not to him because he's building something. Yeah. Remember when I said every detail matters and that's what I learned from them, which is it, it all matters in that. Now you got to find it can't be work. And that's the other part that I found with it. So I found that you, you got to care about all the details, but you got to find something that you love to do. It doesn't matter what it is. I don't care what it is. Most people get fixated on money. Um, you know, if I was fixated on money, I wouldn't be where I am today because Apple was failing and not succeeding. And it took us a long time before we became successful, but I love what I was doing and I thought I could make a difference. And again, if you do that, then the money part always seems to find itself and solve itself. And so you got to find the things that you love to do so that it's not work. Yeah. I mean, people ask me all the time. It's like, you know, how hard is it? I mean, you, you must work a ton of hours. Like how many days a, week, a year do you work? And I'm like, oh, I work about 30 days a year. And I was like, what do you mean 30 days a year? What are you talking about? I said, no, the other 335 days, I'm having fun. I love what I'm doing. I wouldn't trade it for the world. I wake up every day motivated, excited. Now that 30 days were you know, it's, it's not so much fun, something bad happened or something negative or whatever, I'm tired, whatever it is, but most of the days it is, but, and, and that's the, you gotta, you gotta love it. Cause if you're going to have that work ethic, it's not work. Yep. 100%. And right? you, you yep. know, you love it. It's, it, uh, you know what I compare it to, if, if you listen closely to every athlete after they've had a big game or won an award, and it, someone interviews them and asks them a question, they always say, you know, I, I was, I worked hard. I put myself in this position. This is what I worked on in practice every single day. And I think sometimes, you know, that doesn't get enough credit for all of the other things that we've talked about are important, but you know, the fact that you talked about work ethic when it came to leadership, ultimately there's nothing that will ever replace that. And you gotta put the work in and it doesn't mean, like you said, working 24 seven. I think that was something when I was younger you know, I was in the music industry as, as a kid and that was like drilled home. You know, if you weren't working 24 seven, you weren't getting anything done. And I've never found myself more happy in what I do, calmer and more balanced. And I think that like, it doesn't mean that you're not working your ass off. And I think you never can get around that. And I think that's important because when you go into your job, you may not see the light yet, but if you do put the work in and someone like you is saying that, you know, that ultimately will work out. Like you put the work in and there's obviously luck and stuff, but you gotta put the work in. Well, and as a leader, 
people are looking up to you that way. I mean, I, I, I was, I was always amazed. Here's Steve. He's accomplished so many things in life. Tim has accomplished so many things in life, right? What, it, why do they keep doing it? Right. It's like, and, and so boy, if they're doing it, how can I not be doing it too? It's like, uh, and again, I, I think if you find the things you love now, the other part too, by the way, that, that you learn is you gotta, everything is, is, is about it. I coach K says this better than anybody. Um, it's, it's the people you're around with because ultimately no matter who you are, you can't be great at everything. Yeah. And so I always tell people, if you're, if you, if you can do anything in life, be able to look at a mirror and admit to yourself the things you're not good at. Yeah. And not because you're ever going to get great at them, but you better find some people around you that are really great at that. Um, and I've gotten, you know, one of the, I've got an amazing team of people. And so, you know, when, when you have an amazing team, you can accomplish amazing things yeah. by myself or without an amazing team, you can't accomplish anything. Yeah. Um, so I used to always say, it's like, would I rather have a thousand people or 10 great people? I'd rather have 10 great people. I'll run circles around a thousand people yeah. if they're not, you know, organized, single vision, doing the right thing. I mean, and so you got to really work on, on the people, you know, as a, as a leader, the most important job you have is who you hire. Yeah. Most important thing you do. That's good to know. That's good advice as I'm building my company out, because I think I also, I heard Bill Gates speak once about, you know, his answer to something very macro was investing in people, investing in people around them and <clears throat> knowing how important that was going to be to getting to where he wanted to go. Um, I could talk to you and I can talk to you um, forever, but let's bring up some uh, students now. I think we have, they've been waiting. So we, our first student is Brian Edwards. Brian, come up and ask any questions. By the way, this, everything we're doing, hi Brian, but before everything we're doing here is just an example of how great my job is because we have so much opportunity to make technology better. <laughs> you think about this whole experience that we're doing it and it's amazing that we got it, but boy, can it be so much better. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, Brian. There we go. How you doing? Great to see you. Great to see you too. Thanks so much for coming out tonight. It's been a great conversation and really enjoyed learning from both of you. Um, I'm in EdT's class called the Business of Sport, and we're looking at the intersection between sports, technology, and media, how they come together, and particularly how live sports and gaming are content play. Um, can you explain your All Originals approach with Apple TV, and also how does sports play into your strategy with Apple TV Plus? Yeah, it's it's. I, I think what's happening is, as I said, this traditional way of hey, the game starts at this, it's on this channel. I mean, that stuff's obviously going away. Um, and so you have to have a lot more interaction and, and things have to be pushed to you. And, and so, and, and technology has all these capabilities, but if you look at it today, most sports as it's, t as it's broadcast live is actually very restrictive and closed. And so you can't add things to it. You can't modify things. You can't do anything to it. Um, it's very much streamed and, and delivered in a single way without any capability. That's going to change. And, th and that's one of the, the huge opportunities. That's what's going to open up gaming and other things, right? People talk about, hey, wouldn't it be great to do sports betting or whatever? Well, sure, it might be, but you can't do it if it's one way that way. And I got to be able to switch quickly and I want to be able to see multiple things and I, I want to get highlights real time. I want to do all these different things with sports stats, I, you know. If there's a no hitter going on, you know, and I'm, it's during baseball season, I want to know about it so I can tune in right away. Uh, and so it's not rocket science, actually. Um, the problem is, like I said, the environment's been closed. And so as this gets more and more open, then you can allow people to innovate on top of it. One of the cool things is, you know, I could have never guessed when we were doing, I worked on the original app store, we built the app store. I could have never guessed that Uber would come along wasn't smart enough to think of that um, around it. It was all built on that technology. Well, things will happen in sports like that, but they can't today because there's nothing you can build off of. It's a closed environment and that's what's gonna change and open it up 
uh, around it. We don't know yet on TV Plus what's going to happen in sports uh, around it. As I said, I'm excited about it because of the changes, and change means opportunity, and opportunity means that it, you know the winners are the ones that are the most innovative and can do the coolest things and, and give people what they want and sometimes give them what they want, like I said, around the corner where they don't even know they want it yet until they see it. Uh, and, and that's what we're trying to do. And it's going to be, it's going to be a lot of fun, uh, to do. Thanks, Brian. Um, it's crazy when you just say like, I built the app store. It sounds amazing. when I Well, we, I should say to make yeah. clear, cause I that's mean, goes back to my team. Of course. You know, yeah. the wildest, in the wildest dreams, but that's the beauty of life. You know, everybody starts by saying, I got to have the, you know, the billion dollar idea. Well, billion dollar ideas. If you start with the premise of I got to have a billion dollar idea, you'll never have one. Yeah. There wasn't a there wasn't a soul on the planet that thought the app store was a billion dollar idea. Just built it. <laughs> it's like uh, uh, Daniela Schneider. Sorry. I like the uh, you jumped on. There you Hi, go. how's it going? Good to meet you. Nice to meet you. First off, Eddie, I think that shirt's a little too Carolina blue, but we'll look over it for now. <laughs> I see the blue devil, but it looks Carolina blue. Um, but anyway, my question for you is how do you each determine which companies to make early stage investments in? Well, it's, a, it's a great question for Rich. For us, it's really easy. We don't make, we don't make early stage investments. We acquire. Um, and, and generally because in our world, when we look at an early company, we probably buy, my guess is probably about 30 companies a year generally all relatively small. Uh, for the kind of things that we're building, we see there's a huge opportunity and we like make an acquisition and, and sort of bring them in because we think we can accomplish what we want and more importantly, what they want faster. Uh, and so that's how we generally work. So we're looking at less investments and more acquisitions uh, where we can you know, bring what we have and, and just let them go and go way faster. Yeah, and I think for us, um, you know, we invest usually in seed rounds, series A, series A, series A round, and, and we'll follow up at times. And we're writing relatively small check sizes comparative to Apple. Not Apple small, but relatively small. And when we look at these companies, we have a pretty cool filter to begin with. We were fortunate enough to build up a great network to be able to have deal flow from great VCs and great founders. Uh, and then from there, we really proved to be strategic investors. And then from there became more deal flow and, and more connection. But for us, it's usually A, if we get it, you know, like doesn't mean if it's a great idea or not, but if, if I get it, like sometimes I just don't really get it. And if I can wrap my head around it and I can envision it, whether I'm using it or not, if I can just envision it, it's something that I really dive into, have to really connect with the founders because we're meeting these people again at early stages. So you know these are the people that are taking you and your investment on this ride. Um, and then there's obviously the traditional analysis, but really those are the two things. And then from there, there's certain companies that we become a bit more active with that invest in us because we can now collaborate and consult for some of them, create content with some of them. And that's the beauty of these early stage companies is some of them have now blossomed into business that you know we'll collaborate on with Boardroom or Kevin. So. It's a, it's, it's a great area for us, and it's, um, we see a whole handful of cool opportunities. I have one question for you. Sorry, I got a question for you. So for other me? than, yeah, <laughs> uh, other, uh, other than Duke, who's, who's your other favorite team? Oh my gosh. Well, currently I'm working for the Pistons, so since they're paying my, my bills right now, I feel like I've got to say the Pistons. Okay, so yeah. I'm, gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a good lesson on this okay. one. Whoever's playing Carolina, Next question. You're right about that. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Thanks so much. All right. Um, the next speaker who's on now is my nephew, Miles Fewer. And Miles is putting together a sports conference on March 25th at Duke. So I hope we gave you some good insight tonight. Uh, Miles, come on and talk to Eddie. Hey, Eddie. How has uh, COVID and virtual communication affected the work culture of Apple? Uh, well, first of all, it's been a lot better. It's worked out a lot better than I ever would have dreamed of. And, and what I mean by that is how much we've been able to keep going, uh, build products, you know, continue what we were doing. But that's not the, the real question. And I think the, the real question we're getting to right now, which is people have gotten used to working from home. 
a lot of people have. And the question is what's gonna happen in, in a post COVID world? Uh, are people gonna keep working from home? And I will tell you, at least in the Apple case, we need to be working in person. Um, we cannot innovate uh, at the speed and the level that we do uh, remotely. And the example of this is even when we're having this call right here, if this was a meeting in person, Rich and I do, we actually do some, some business together. We're doing some, an amazing TV show together um, on Apple TV Plus, And we talk about other things. And that happens when you're dealing in person. And this type of a call, for example, if I think of something right now that I wanna to talk to, to Rich about, I can't bring it up on the call. When the call hangs up, I got another call waiting for me. And now I got to call Rich and he's probably on another call. So I'm not even going to bother calling him. There's no serendipity. There's no like communication that happens at a personal level around this, at least with the, the way the technology exists today. So yes, will more people be working from home? Yeah, it'll, it'll work more, but we got to get back to the office and, or, or to central places where we can interact with each other more frequently than we are today, which is not at all. Right. We have had nobody in the office since back in March, uh, basically. And, uh, and it's been difficult, I think. Again, we, we've been able to overcome a lot of it. And, uh, but I don't think we're as good as we could be if we were all together. So it's, it's challenging. Thanks, Miles. Uh, Anna, you're on. Hi. Um, my question would be, um, do you have any advice for someone just starting out in the professional world, specifically anything you would tell your younger self fresh out of Duke, as many of us are about to find ourselves? Yeah, try. Don't be scared to try something you're not comfortable with. Um, you know, you, you may. One of Steve Jobs' greatest attributes is he was able to, um, in his mind, at least, he was able to see talents in people that in my case, that I didn't even know I had. And I discovered a talent I had when I was in my early 30s. I guarantee you, you don't think when you're, by the time you're in your 30s, that there's some talent you have that you haven't discovered. <laughs> um, but you don't, because you may not have gotten an opportunity to try it. And so a lot of times is, is and you always learn from them, even if it's not the thing you want to do, you, like I said, I didn't want to run a call center my whole life, but I learned a lot from it. And it's impacted me, I think, in a huge way, in a very positive way on the things I do. So I always tell people, try to try to change a lot. Try to try different things. Uh, you'll learn a lot. You'll learn a lot about yourself. You'll learn a lot about how to be better at ultimately the thing that you want to do. And, and uh, you also are able to bring um, new thinking into areas. You know, one of the, the opportunities when you go into a new area is you don't know how to do it. <laughs> and so in a way, you come at it from a point of view that's different. And so somebody will go, well, we always do it that way. Well, why? Why don't we do it this way? We could do it a better way. Um, and so you really get an opportunity to do that. And, and sometimes you know, you'll figure out, well, there's a reason they do it that way. It is a better way. But a lot of times it's just because it's the way it's done. And so I, I, I always encourage people, try new things. Sometimes it may not think, you know, you, you never know the, the path your career takes. And so when you do this one thing, you don't know where it's going to lead. Yep. Right? If you had asked me graduating from Duke computer science degree, working at Apple, hypercard programming. Now, today, I'm talking to, you know, Reese Witherspoon to decide whether we're doing this thing with a TV show or, I mean, there's no one in their right mind that would have thought that's going to happen, right? The, the path is not that clear. Uh, around it but it's all these different things that that happened that gave you the opportunity and if you're afraid to try them you you, you may never get the opportunity thank you so much appreciate it uh eddie i guarantee you you were um saying a lot of why when you started getting into the record business side of conversations um and i and i'm sure it was that mentality that allowed you guys to succeed because it was a system in which no one had questioned and you know, you jump into it. And I find myself doing that because again, like I was a manager, now I'm investing in VC and creating a platform again, no study for it. And when you're going into it and learning it, you know, going into it and asking why and asking those questions and not being afraid to ask those questions probably gives you the freshest perspective going into some of this. And I'm sure that was helpful for you dealing with movie heads of studios and 
Um, here's, look, Rich, here's an example. So we get into TV, we're going to decide, we decide to get into TV plus. Well, why do we decide to do TV plus? I mean, you start with that problem. And the reason why is because we looked at, again, I said the incumbents, you look at the newcomers. And what we saw was um, basically everybody was after quantity. In other words, you felt like you had to have a lot of catalog, a lot of library, a lot of new stuff and not quality. And we were like, well, gee, we think like being the best is more important than being the most. It's our world. It's the way we think. It's not always the case, by the way. Lots, lots of people that are the most do really well, but it's not how, we, how we're made and, and how we think about things. And so we wanted to do something that was the most. And so you, you go into that and you say, okay, well, we think there's an opportunity to create a, a new world where the content we're creating is the best. Well, everybody tells you, you can't do that. You got to have catalog. If you don't have catalog, you don't have enough stuff. Therefore, people won't come and you just can't build a business that way. And so everybody who started a business started with catalog. And, and, and we were adamant. I was adamant about it. I was like, I don't, if we're going to put our name behind something, it's got to be something we created. Yeah. It can't be something that was already out there and now we're just putting our name on it. Yeah. And by the way, who needs that? There's a bunch of other players doing that already. And so we're not going to add any value. We're not going to be any better at doing that than the other guys. And so you have, you kind of have to also pick the, you know, how you're going to, what, what is it that makes you better? Why, why, why are you going to be better than what's out there? Yep. That's good advice, man. The differentiation point. Um, Sean Scully is our last question. I don't know him, but I guarantee you his friends call him Scully. My uh, question is, is he related to John Scully? I, I'm not, okay. unfortunately. But um, yeah, thanks, uh, Rich and Eddie, for being on. I think everyone that's um, in the Zoom is very appreciative that you guys have taken the time to do this. Um, Eddie, I know you guys talked, or you talked about earlier um, the success of like Apple's culture and their loyalty. Uh, kind of transitioning, like, what would you uh, tell, like, all of these uh, new tech ventures about establishing, like, the right culture and laying the correct groundwork and helping to, like, build that loyalty? Yeah, look, there, you can't, first of all, take anything for granted. So, you know, it, it all starts around different things from your um, ethical positions to your work, um, but I, I always go back to the same thing, which is if, if you're trying to create something for a customer, um, that's the most important thing. And, and if you focus on that first, second, and third, and make sure that you're driving that, um, then always good things happen around it. Most of the things that mistakes that we've made um, have generally been because we, we take our eye even a little bit off the ball on that. And so when you go back to some of the, the things that we've done where we've, we've not done as well, it's been because of that. And, and uh, you know, I think as we've gotten bigger, I'll tell you something that's, that's hard to do. When you're small, it's really easy to say no. Because if you're small, you have to prioritize and you have to focus. So one of the great things about a startup or when you're thinking about getting started on something and you're in a small team, even if it's a large company, you don't have a lot of resources. You don't have a lot of capital. So you've got to make sure that you have a bullseye focus on what it is you're going to do or you'll fail right away. As your company grows, lots of companies lose that because all of a sudden you have a lot more resources, a lot more money and think you can do a lot and you lose focus. Um, and uh, if you want to be great at something, at least in the way I look at it and, and we've looked at it is I, we don't know how to be great at 100 things or 20 things. It's hard to be great at one thing. And so the only way to do that is you got to put all of your energies and focus behind what it is you're trying to do. And so I always encourage startups to focus in on what it is they're going to do for customers and make sure they do that better than anybody else. Um, and if you do that, then you, you lots of times you'll win. Um, you know, I, um, I'll leave you guys with this and, and it's, it's my, my thing. I, I've always thought of it this way is, is it takes three things to be really successful. Um, one, you've got to execute really, really well on what you're doing. This gets back to focus, doing great at it. Um, you have 100% control of that. A second thing is, what are your competitors doing? And by the way, you have zero control of that. 
but they determine some of your success, by the way, because if somebody does it better than you, then you won't be as successful. And when somebody does it worse than you, they make you look even better than you really are um, in some cases. And a third one is it's hard to do almost anything today isolated that you control it all yourself. And so you have to realize what and whom you're dependent on and can you actually do it at that time and be successful? I'll give you a quick analogy to that. So we're having tremendous success with Apple Pay. Um, not surprisingly, it's a lot more fun to pay with your phone than taking a wallet out, taking a credit card, swiping all the stuff, sticking it in now with the thing waiting, stick the card out waiting. All. Apple Pay is way better. Um, but we thought of this many, many years ago, but we didn't introduce it. Well, why didn't we introduce it? Because, well, in order to get Apple Pay to be successful, all these terminals that have credit cards need to support NFC, which is the wireless technology that you use to pay. Well, in order to do that, they got to replace every terminal. Well, if you think about how many terminals exist out in the world, it's a lot of terminals to replace. If we launch Apple Pay and we're going to go live with it, it would take us 100 years to get all the terminals changed, right? And so we didn't launch it, even though we had the technology, we had the ability to do it. Um, but that third piece made it so that you couldn't make it work. But along comes these credit cards now have a chip on them. If you know, every credit card you have has a chip and it's called chip and pin. And the reason they put the chip in is so that people can't create fake credit cards. Well, in order for these terminals to support these chips, they had to change the terminals around. Well, they have the same problem I just described, except for one difference. The guys that are doing the chips are the banks, right? So the banks turned around and said to all the merchants with all of these terminals, and they said, you've got two years to replace your terminals to support the chip. If you don't change it after two years, then any fraud that occurs is on you. Well, guess what happens now? Every merchant's going to change over that two-year window because they're not going to accept fraud. Well, when they're going to make that change now, they're all going to change the terminal. Well, it's really easy for them to change it with NFC now. So now we can come along and do all the great things that we do and they can help us make it happen. That timing piece, you don't control, right? You're dependent on others to do that. And so sometimes you can be too late, too early. A lot of companies end up being too early into something, right? It's not ready yet, right? We would have, we could have been too early. It would have been, it, we'd be sitting here talking today and you might be asking me, well, why was Apple Pay a failure? Uh, instead of me telling you what a success it was. And so th those are parameters as you think of your, of your company, you know, one, you control completely, two, don't worry about it. Don't lose any sleep over it. Make sure you keep an eye on it and you look at it, but I don't, don't love it. Everybody's like, do you lose, what do you lose sleep on? I never lose sleep on my competitors. I don't control anything of what they do. I'm only worried about what I'm doing. And then I worry about, am I dependent on somebody else? And is that going to work? Thanks, Sean. Scully. Thank you. Um, all right, Eddie, appreciate it. Appreciate Pepsi. Appreciate Duke, I'm going to give it back to Ed, to Professor, to close up. Um, thank you again, man. I will see you soon, speak to you soon. I learned a lot. I'm sure the students learned a lot. And um, yeah, thank you. Don't let anybody out there tell you. You guys, uh, you know, if I could change places with one of you, I'd do it in a heartbeat. The world is in a, you know, it's like everybody gets very negative in the world and all that. And, you know, the, whether sports and the ratings are going, this is the best time. You know what the best day to be alive is today. You know, what's better than today, tomorrow. And so you guys have an amazing opportunity uh, with all the changes and, and that are taking place to make the world a better place and, and make customers. If you're in sports to make it just a whole lot better experience. And so, I'm envious that, that you, you, you have that for a longer time than I'm going to get to get it. So don't let anybody tell you otherwise. And thank you for having me. Does that go for me too? I'm 44. Will you switch places with me? Uh, I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. And All right. Take care. Real quick. Just a couple of housekeeping. Thank you. So uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. I want to give a special shout out to, uh, to Alex uh, Scheinman for sort of set, arranging and organizing all this. And Miles um, did a great job sort of bringing this to Duke. 
Um, and I assume later on we will indeed uh, find out who won the Zion autograph poster and the KD Duke shoes. Um, it was a great, great program tonight. Uh, thanks everyone for attending. Unfortunately for my 56 kids, we're going to switch over and uh, go to our Zoom, our regular Zoom class. Um, but if you have questions or follow-ups that you want uh, with Rich and Eddie, um, particularly the boardroom ambassador positions that, uh, that they're talking about, uh, Alex will be available. And again, what a wonderful experience. Uh, two absolutely great guys. Uh, very lucky to have them. Uh, and thank you all for attending. And again, my regular class, I'll see you back in the Zoom in about 15, 20 minutes. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you.